Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our WUYU webinar, Clinical Applications of Corneal Topography with Dr. Aaron Wolf. Dr. Wolf, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I myself use topography all the time, and I'm super excited to learn from you uh, tonight. So thank you. Yeah, happy to be here. Next slide. So I'm your host, Dr. Lise Kramer. And next slide. So I will introduce our wonderful speaker tonight, Dr. Aaron Wolf, owner of Austin Optometry Group in Austin, Texas. Dr. Aaron Wolf received his Doctor of Optometry degree from the University of Houston in 2009. He is the owner of Austin Optometry Group, a private practice in Austin, Texas, focusing on ocular surface disease and specialty contact lenses, including scleral lenses and orthokeratology. Dr. Wolf provides a topography guided and tomography guided corneal, scleral, and orthokeratology lenses, ocular impression based lenses, and custom HOA correcting lenses. He has fitted more than 1,500 scleral lens cases and more than 500 orthokeratology cases. Wow, that's amazing. Dr. Wolf is the first doctor in Texas to earn all of the following clinical fellowships Fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society and Fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. He has served as product development consultant, IRB research participant, and is a key opinion leader for numerous interior surface imaging manufacturers and specialty contact lens manufacturers. So without further ado, I will let you take it away and definitely excited to learn from you. And I'll see you back toward the end of the presentation. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Kramer. And yeah, I just had uh, some of my financial disclosures. Ultimately, they're just, uh, I do a lot of work, obviously, in, in uh, this uh, corneal imaging, especially contact lens field. So a lot of those relationships are just in regards to kind of um, playing a small role in pushing the technology forward. So tonight, we're going to talk about corneal topography, which is, you know, like Dr. Kramer, this is one of my favorite topics. This is kind of like I would feel like of all the things I do on a clinical basis day to day, the majority is probably in regards to corneal topography or this greater umbrella that is corneal topography. So what we're going to talk about tonight is basically the different types. You know, the topic is really corneal topography, but what we're actually going to do is we're going to talk about uh, corneal imaging. So we're going to kind of blanket it all together under that that uh, topography uh, umbrella, but it's essentially you know tomography. It's going to be corneoscleral profilometry. Um, it's going to be you know OCT, um, even some impression uh, discussion here, and kind of where it all fits in with essentially uh, getting a, a viewpoint picture of the uh, the patient's eyes. We're going to talk about indications for topography, which ultimately you know more of a um, a uh, uh, insurance, I guess, viewpoint on uh, on topography indications. And we're going to talk about daily applications, which is really essentially what we're actually be doing with all this technology from a day-to-day -day standpoint and, and how it might benefit us and our patients, our practices. And then, um, uh, you know, a little bit of what are you looking at, right? So I think a lot of people on here are pretty, you know, comfortable with corneal topography maps. There may be some people who are not. There may be uh, you know, some software that you know maybe exists in your devices that you're not really utilizing. So we'll we'll try to, you know, uh, pick away at some of that. And then we won't spend a lot of time on billing, but I will basically just provide some codes that, that may, be, may be relevant. You know, it is a big topic, and so we're not probably going to be able to hit everything, but we are going to try to get as far as we can tonight. And I'll, I'll try to make sure we, we cover as much ground as, as we can within this hour. All right. So essentially this is kind of how I break down, you know, corneal measurement devices. You know, you basically have these, you know, kind of more, I guess, uh, rudimentary type devices to these really sophisticated devices. And, and we're going to kind of break down each one. So when we think about, I guess, the most basic way of measuring a cornea, uh, it really comes down to keratometry. And this was essentially, I guess, the first way that we could, you know, get some kind of quantitative measurements of the, uh, the shape or structure of the cornea. But it's, you know, it's not really used that much anymore. I, I don't I don't know. There, there might be plenty of you uh, that are using it. This um, picture is from a uh, keratometer that is in my office. So uh, this uh, this thing is probably about a 50 year old keratometer. Um, I admit I, it has not been turned on in over probably over a decade. I just don't totally know what to do with it. It looks cool, uh, you know, from a patient conversation standpoint. But 
it's not going to be super relevant. It's only going to give you, you know, your two main principal meridians and only about two or three millimeters, you know, from the center of the cornea. So obviously it's not going to be great for um, corneal, you know, contact lens fitting or, or really even uh, from a quantitative standpoint from uh, ectasia and, and uh, uh, that kind of diagnostic side. So this is our bread and butter. This is placido disc corneal topography. So whenever you kind of think about corneal topography, this is probably what you're thinking about. This is the majority of the different instruments that are on the market. Uh, how placido disc works is basically it's a projection of these rings. So it could be, you know, a, a relatively few amount of rings or it could be a lot of rings, but ultimately these, these concentric rings project onto the eye. There's a known, um, you know, basically steel ball, kind of a, a spherical steel ball. And then the uh, that's your reference. And then when you project this onto the eye, the algorithms from the computer are essentially going to compare that to that known calibration ball. And then that's how it essentially determines where the lines are further apart or closer together or distorted. You know, it'll essentially build a color-coded map to that. Two main breakdowns in placido disc topographers. You're going to essentially have a large cone device and you're gonna have a small cone device. Most of the units on the market are gonna be large cone devices. So those are gonna sit a little bit further from the eye. They're gonna have a little bit, you know, fewer rings. The diameter on the eye may be relatively small. Sometimes you might get 10, maybe, maybe a little bit bigger if you're lucky. And it's gonna have roughly about five to 10,000 data points on large uh, cone devices. Benefits, though, is that it's a lot faster and easier um, on different eye anatomies in some ways um, with, you know, kids. Sometimes they're a little squirmy or or difficult or something. Um, so there are some advantages. And then with small cone devices, you know, that's going to come much closer to the eye. So, you know, if a large cone may be four or five inches, you know, from the eye, a small cone is going to be probably like one to two inches from the eye. But when it brings it in to closer to the eye, you actually get a lot more data points. So you're actually getting about over 100,000 data points on the small cone devices. And you're getting essentially a much bigger scan. So the Placido disc topography, it does map only the front surface of the eye. Um, it is going to be um, like keratometry. Its main, what I would call language, is going to be in curvature. So it's like, you know, it's like... Uh, your first language is English or, or Spanish or whatever, you know, the topographer's first language is going to be curvature and its secondary language is going to be elevation. So we'll basically derive elevation points um, through an algorithm based on curvature data. Okay, uh, this is still going to be probably your best unit for, you know, uh, taking imaging over top of a contact lens on the eye. Also has uh, a lot of other uses, which we know with, you know, tear film and, and draw eye compatibility. It is going to interpolate data, which basically means it's going to blend data points. So that can be kind of a good thing, especially with um, uh, projection type devices where dry eye might be an issue. If you get any kind of erroneous data points, the computer will essentially overlook it and kind of blend it together. So it doesn't really mess up with your picture. So on the left, you got a small cone device. On the right, you got a large cone. It's the same patient, same eye. So you can see that, you know, the patterns look about the same. You get your figure eight pattern there with the astigmatism. Um, you know, for the most part, it's your metrics are even going to be about the same. Um, both are going to have, um, you know, asymmetry analysis. Uh, but if you look over here where the rings are, these Myers, which the technical term for all this is called keratoscopy, you can see that you're going to get a lot more rings on the small cone devices that get way out to the limbus or even beyond. Um, sometimes in large cone devices, you may not quite get that far out. Uh, this is just another example kind of showing the same thing. You know, the shape, you know, maps, they're basically going to be very similar because, again, this is the same patient on both devices. Um, it's just the, you know, the, the size may be a little bit different. Again, Placido disc topography is still going to be basically your, your kind of gold standard device over top of a lens. It just does a really nice job of mapping out uh, power change. So again, going back to that initial language of a placido disc device being, you know, curvature, it does really great if you have like a um, multifocal contact lens, um, even if you're actually just wanting to double check your base curve of a contact lens or something, you can basically take the, the image over top of it. It just works really nice with that. These are all just images of multifocal optics with the contact lens in place. 
Similarly, if it's mapping out optics of the contact lens, this is just a case showing uh, basin and vertical prism. So this is, I don't totally remember. I, I want to say this is about two, I think it was like something like two basin in each eye and then um, base up on the right eye, base down on the left eye. But you can kind of see how you can, you can visualize that, okay? And it is nice to be able to do that because when you order these, you know, specialized lenses with this type of optics, whether it's multifocals or, or prism, you really want to be able to confirm that, that it is doing what it's doing or it's in the right place. The next uh, device we're going to talk about is another one that you don't, you don't see too much anymore, but there are, there are still plenty of them floating around out there, and it's called the Slit Scanning Tomographer. So a slit scan tomographer, you know, in, in the U.S., one that, you know, essentially you might remember is the orb scan. That's essentially our, our, our main one that's out there. There's another one that's prominent in uh, South America, but in the U.S., it was basically the orb scan that was that was big. So uh, basically what it's going to do is going to um, project this beam onto the cornea, and it's got all these uh, slits that are projected 45 degrees to the camera. So um, it did do the whole cornea. So it did the front you know, the back of the cornea, and obviously it's going to drive, you know, pack imagery or corneal thickness from that. Um, and it did, you know, uh, kind of blend the data points. The uh, issue was it wasn't super accurate. So, you know, maybe kind of underestimated, you know, flat curves or overestimated steep curves, or it just, it just wasn't as good as, I guess, some other technology. So it kind of, kind of faded away a little bit. Where it really got replaced, and this is kind of our gold standard in, um, you know, particularly with like uh, keratoconus and ectasia, and, um, really disease, you know, pathology-based uh, imaging is going to be your Scheinflug tomography. So this is actually going to use a rotating camera that basically uh, circles around. It takes about 50 uh, uh, OCT scans of the eye as it rotates for about two seconds. And then that two seconds is going to take about 25,000 elevation points. Okay. Um now, as far as, again, the front, back, middle of the eye, okay, I think we all kind of know that about Scheinflug. Your, your main one in the U.S. is going to be essentially your Pinacam. Uh, of course, there are other ones out there too. Um, now, this is different. So where keratometry and placido dystopography, their main language was in curvature, and their secondary language is really in elevation, it's essentially going to change from, from here on out. So basically, your main language is going to be in elevation points, and then the algorithms will... Uh, essentially um, deduce curvature based on the elevation points, okay? Um, it also can scan out to the sclera as well. That's a, a newer development in, in the last few years, but now it can go out to about 18 millimeters um, on the eye. And this is, again, your gold standard for, you know, keratoconus detection and, and various ectasias. This is kind of an example of... Uh, some of what that software is going to look like on the left is basically you know the front part of the cornea and on the right is going to be the back part of the cornea and it's going to have a number of um uh analytics over here it essentially is going to basically see if how it thins out from the middle and it, it gets thicker as it goes out how regular is that rate okay if you have keratoconus or something it's going to be really thin or thinner than i guess typical in a certain spot and then the rate in which it's going to thicken out to more normal tissue, it's going to be it's going to be a little quicker. So it's going to show up on your images here. This is basically kind of very mild keratoconus on the top, and and more severe keratoconus on the bottom. Um, this is an example of how I mentioned that this technology can scan out to the sclera. So this is just uh, what their software looks like. You're going to get this colorful map right here, which is you see the blues and the and the oranges or reds. So this is an elevation map, okay, not, not a curvature map. Again, this main language is going to be an elevation. And then, you know, cooler colors are going to be lower, warmer colors are going to be higher. Uh, with this particular instrument, you can either, you know, stitch together, you know, about five different views, or you can take it all in one. I'm, I'm always a proponent of just taking uh, a, single, a single scan or a, a single capture instrument. Um, but this is what that yellow map is. It's just basically your, your capture here. If you look to the right, this is going to be your, your Scheinflug OCT images. So the brighter one is scanning your cornea, and then the dimmer one is basically uh, scanning the, the sclera. So kind of in that same vein is going to be your traditional uh, anterior segment OCTs. So, you know, you can use this, obviously, we, we know with glaucoma, I think that's how it really um, was intended to be used, but we've since really um, changed that. 
Um, and now we're using a lot for various corneal issues. Again, you know, pachymetric uh, measurements. Uh, we use it all the time with imaging of contact lenses. You may even potentially use it to help you design or, or you know, uh, uh, order contact lenses. So in, in the optometry world, um, that's a pretty common use. And so what we're used to seeing is spectral domain. That's basically most all the OCTs you can think of, the one that you probably have in your office right now, uh, almost certainly is going to be your spectral domain OCT. It takes about 25,000 A scans per second, and it's going to measure up to about 16 millimeters on genetics longest um, uh, image. There is a couple of these out in the world. There's uh, one that just became available in the U.S. in the last few months, um, but um, there's two of them that are more common in Europe. There are swept source OCTs. So the swept source OT OCT is going to essentially just be a higher definition version of that. So it's going to take about 50,000 A scans per second, and then it's going to you know, more or less scan the same uh, size uh, up to about 16, 16 and a half millimeters. This particular uh, device is both of these, they do offer also corneal mapping. So outside of just a, a regular OCT image, uh, it'll actually create essentially like a tomography um, uh, map, kind of like the Shine Flug uh, software would do, uh, but it doesn't do scleral data yet. And then the most recent is going to be your hyperparallel OCT. Hyperparallel OCT is not even available yet, but that is something that the company has developed. And then essentially you have to get on a, uh, an interest list. But this is something that looks like it's, it's going to be a little bit of a game changer. So you'll see a picture of that in a moment. This is your spectral domain OCT. So it's just what you're used to seeing. You just have to manually measure kind of where the, the end of the, the sclera is. That would be the beginning of the cornea. And kind of, you know, you draw your line, you do it essentially by hand, and then you can find out what your sagittal height is, but you're really only getting it in that one particular meridian. You'd have to take a ton of these scans in different meridians, and and it's just it, it's just be tedious. But if you kind of want a, a general picture, uh, or you're going to essentially use this to um, maybe grab like an initial diagnostic contact lens, you know, you, you could use this data clinically. Swept source OCT, is um, you can see how it is going to give you a map, just like your your more traditional kind of topography tomography maps off to the left. You can see that the higher the definition is going to be a little bit higher. The the width you know is going to be a little bit wider as well. So this is essentially just um, uh, I guess the, uh, the the next generation in technology. And then this is that hyperparallel OCT that I was mentioning. So again, this takes over 300,000 A scans per second. And this is just a, a, a little video of the front of the cornea, but it actually does this for the entire eye. So what you're seeing there with the cornea and the iris, it would do the same for the cilia body and the retina. It literally is like a 3D recreation of the eye. So that will be really exciting. The next... Um, uh, category of corneal imaging is going to be your Fourier projection corneal scleral prophylometry, which is often just referred to as you know scleral topography. I think it's fine to uh, uh, to use uh, terminology like that as well. So what it's actually going to do is going to project two grids onto the eye. So there's essentially a central camera, and then there's two grids about 45 degrees apart that project this overlapping grid onto the eye. And it's going to basically get essentially as wide as you get the eyelid open. So it can actually get wider than 20 millimeters, although you would really almost never you know, need data that, that far out. And it takes about half a million data points from this. Now, just like your tomography, just like your OCT, the main language is going to be elevation. Okay, so it's going to be elevation data points, which will give you an elevation map, a colorful map, and then, but it can also derive that into curvature. So it's going to give you regular corneal metrics, you know, your Ks and your, you know, whatever, um, your, your normal topography map. Um, now, what's interesting and somewhat unique on the Fourier projecting device is it does not interpolate data. It's really the only one that doesn't do that. So essentially, if you have like a dry spot or a scar tissue or, or something that's uh, maybe some punctate staining or, or whatever it might be that's that's uh, maybe not real, um, it, the software is not going to smooth it over and ignore it. It's going to show it on your scan. So the benefit of that is basically if your quality of scan is not good, you, you can kind of see it, you know, more uh, uh, definitely. And, and then you can kind of repeat it. Or if you're, you know, you've got an issue with the cornea, you know, you'll, you'll see it more. Um, but the downside is, you, you know, it, it, it's, it, there's no smoothing over. You don't have to just take a new image if you get a bad one. 
These are some uh, examples of your Fourier projection uh, profilometry. So you can see where the red ring is, is going to be your cornea. Uh, you know, with elevation maps, again, you know, warmer colors are higher, cooler colors are lower. So you even see like a little bit of a pinguecula kind of off to the, the nasal side here. Okay, the, the shades of green and blue will tell you about the uh, uh, the elevation and curvature, um, the uh, basically geography of the eye and the sclera. Um, down in the bottom right, you can see, you know, corneal eleva elevation as well. Um, basically, um, an assessment of, you know, quality of your maps as far as dryness. You'll get your infrared imaging and it'll give you kind of a 3D, a 3D recreation of the eye. So this is interesting, and, and Dr. Kramer, I know you have one of these devices too, so I'm sure you notice this all the time. You know, before we had devices like this, you would assume that, you know, your corneal astigmatism would really just extend out into the sclera, right? So if you didn't have much corneal astigmatism, maybe you probably didn't have much scleral astigmatism, or if you had a lot of corneal astigmatism, you would also have a lot of scleral astigmatism and really in the same direction. But what we've actually found is this is really pretty much unrelated. So the, uh, the two surfaces sometimes they have nothing to do with each other. You see on the image on the left, you've got this, you know, kind of vertical, um, you know, steepening. So basically a, a with the rule uh, corneal astigmatism, and it extends out almost exactly uh, into the sclera. And then on the, uh, the other side, this is the left eye, same thing. You've got this vertical, you know, uh, steepening you, with, with the rule of astigmatism, but you can see where the blue is. It's now essentially like an against the rule uh, sclera. The other thing that's interesting on this particular case is that this is the same person, right? So sometimes you get just totally unrelated, you know, scleral symmetry between one eye to the next. And, and that's why it's so important to map this, uh, especially if you're going to be fitting contact lenses or uh, scleral lenses, because you really can't make any assumptions about shape out here. Ocular impressions, I wanted to throw this in here because ultimately it is a, uh, a corneal imaging corneal measurement type technology, um, what it is is literally like, uh, essentially it's like a dental impression, but it's going to be a, a, a polyvinyl siloxane impression material that just goes up against the eye, hold it there for a couple minutes and it kind of cures. When you take it away, you're going to have essentially an imprint of the eye. So same thing, you can get over, you know, 20 millimeters of data. It's going to take over a million data points from the 3D scan. Um, you know, it's only going to do the front surface, of course, it's just whatever the, the mold or the uh, impression material is, is touching. So obviously just the front of the eye, no uh, uh, corneal thickness, pachymetric or or uh, posterior corneal measurements. Um, the other thing with this is it's, gonna, it's not going to give you any um, color coded maps. Okay. So you're not really going to be able to tell from any kind of quantitative data, how high something is or how low something is or, or what the symmetry looks like. Um, which is good and bad, right? Sometimes you just kind of do want to know quantitatively what it looks like, but at the same time, when you do your topography or tomography or profilometry maps, really kind of what the color coding and the numbers are giving you is just essentially a way for you to visualize in your head how, you know, essentially what the shape of that eye is, right? Versus, you know, when you do the impressions, it's, you know, you you know what the shape of the eye is. I mean, you can just more um, directly kind of visualize that. Obviously, um, it's going to be great for fitting contact lenses. It's essentially, what we use it for, we don't use it for diagnostics or anything. It's it's basically just more of a, a functional um, toolkit uh, kind of thing for contact lenses. It's not uh, not something you're gonna you're gonna perform very often. It works great for these really complicated cases. Your um, your blebs and your tube shunts. A little risky doing that with some other types of lenses. So this is essentially kind of summary of what we just discussed. All right. So, you know, for the most part, there's no, I guess, real like perfect option. They all have their like, you know, pros and cons. Keratometry is going to be the most limited. Placido disc topography, it doesn't check like all the boxes as much as some of the other ones, but that doesn't mean it's the same as keratometry. Placido disc topography is, you know, exponentially more data and more useful, um, but it is limited to anterior cornea. And then, um, you know, it, uh, um, it is going to be dependent on like tear film. Although if you do have some uh, corneal scarring or something like that, um, it won't impact your, uh, your quality of data in that way. Tomography, you know, again, it's going to check a little bit more boxes because it, it does, you know, you know, the entire cornea, um, and it can be used to actually, you know, um, um, map and uh, measure, um, uh, corneal scars and, um, opacities. That's a nice feature too. Um, 
And then uh, your um, profilometry, your profilometry is going to be very similar to your corneal topography, except for it's going to go just much further out. And then OCTs, again, kind of depends on, on the, uh, the resolution of the OCTs, but the OCTs is, is you know, maybe where the, the, the true future is going to be. All right, so clinical indications. Again, this is really going into what could you build this to? This is not saying what would you do the test for, and that's going to be coming up here soon in what we would call applications. Indications is essentially just based on your uh, your Medicare local coverage determination listing here. You can note that down or screenshot it, but L33810, this is essentially, in, in every payer, maybe a little bit different than this, but they're all generally going to kind of follow in line with, with these Medicare guidelines, okay? So, of course, you're going to have your keratoconus down there. You have your corneal dystrophies, bullous keratopathy. There's a couple in here that you you might not normally think of. Notably, there's a couple that you would, you know, pretty regularly do something like corneal topography war, but you're not going to really be able to get paid for it. And that's going to be like your LASIK screenings. Okay. Uh, you definitely need to do that, but it's not really billable. All right. So applications, this is essentially like, why, why would we have this type of technology? So I think the most obvious reason when you think about corneal topography and, and that greater umbrella is essentially just checking for, you know, irregular corneas, you know, keratoconus, uh, maybe most, most notably, that's also going to be, you know, post-surgical complications, you know, LASIK ectasia, refractive surgery ectasia, RK, things like that. Um, but, you know, also is to kind of check for, you know, is your stigmatism, is it essentially, is it normal stigmatism? Is it not normal stigmatism? Um, you know, what is irregular stigmatism? Irregular stigmatism just has to do with essentially the symmetry of that astigmatism. Um, if that if that kind of figure eight pattern kind of bends or if it's more uh, lopsided in one direction than another, um, unfortunately, just having a lot of astigmatism is not um, considered, you know, irregular stigmatism, although I guess it's a little atypical. Um, again, you're going to use it for, you know, refractive surgery, uh, candidates, orthokeratology, um, as far as your contact lens fitting, your K's eccentricity, essentially that's going to be the rate in which the cornea kind of flattens. Um, again, your astigmatism, overall symmetry. Um, you also want to kind of use it to see if your cornea is impacting the shape of your eye unintentionally, right? So, you know, particularly true with maybe corneal gas permeable lenses, you know, are you creating any kind of corneal molding unintentionally as your soft lens binding and, and creating any changes to the cornea? Um, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, imaging over top of uh, contact lenses already in the eye. So uh, another thing that we didn't talk about was basically lens flexure. So if you're getting kind of an ir irregular um, uh, results in some way with one of your lenses, you can always basically take the topography over the lens and then basically check your case and see if it looks like it's what you expect or if you're getting some some flexure, which would basically be astigmatism over, uh, over that surface. And then, you know, can it be exported into external software? That's CAD CAM uh, software. So there's a lot of these uh, softwares out there. They're a really, really nice way to provide a more customized experience for your patients. And a lot of the, uh, well, I don't know about a lot of them, but there's a few. There's a few instruments that do have um, internal contact lens design uh, software. This is a couple examples of, of some of that. Uh, CAD CAM, CAD is computer aided uh, design, computer aided manufacturing is what that um, stands for. So, uh, you know, on the top left, this is, you know, an internal design uh, system. On the right and on the bottom, these are all just various external um, design systems. And again, this is all the, the same, the same eye, just uh, designed on different, different softwares here. Same thing, you know, in the top, these are just corneal designs. This is an internal system uh, from a corneal topographer. Uh, the one on the right is an internal contact lens design from a um, Scheinflug tomographer. And then down the bottom, these are going to be basically external uh, softwares that, you know, you can use for scleral lenses. And these are from profilometry. Okay, your corneal scleral profilometry. And then that just exports out to the design. And if you have, you know, an irregular eye, or irregular features, you know, on that sclera, this is a really great way to get, again, a very, very customized, fine-fitted lens. The external software also allows you to tackle um, cases that would, you know, largely otherwise be 
I don't know if I'd say impossible. It, it might be impossible. Okay. It might very well be impossible. You know, sometimes you get pretty normal, like in this top left, this is a little normal, you know, kind of astigmatism out in the sclera, which gives it this kind of, kind of like in your glaucoma scans, you know, on, on the RNFL, you'll get that T-SNT, right? Which is essentially just like how much neurofiber do you have as it kind of goes around 360 degrees. Uh, it's essentially the same thing. So there's not a lot of astigmatism here, but the one on the right is like, this is like the most I've ever seen. Uh, this particular patient had about a thousand microns of elevation change um, at the end of like a 16 millimeter lens. So it's um, would have been impossible otherwise. And then just more of the same. You can just literally design the lenses. You can visualize them. You can change them to your own personal preferences. Okay. And as you get deeper into contact lens fitting, you'll just kind of develop your own uh, kind of philosophies in a lot of ways on, on some of these contact lens design. Um, okay. Orthokeratology. I think it goes without saying, but you know, I'll say it anyways, you have to have corneal topography to do orthokeratology. So despite the fact that there are maybe a few companies out there that you can order an initial lens with, with K's and a refraction and maybe like an HVID and who knows, maybe, maybe that's close enough in some cases, but you really it's risky, right? Because if it doesn't work out now, you don't really know what you're doing to the eye. You have to have topography to really be able to troubleshoot or to, to monitor over time or to see when you need to revise your fit or something. It's just an absolute must. It also helps you decide if the person that you know, you're working with would even be a good candidate. Okay. Obviously we talked earlier about, you know, external software and internal design software. Okay. Um, Again, orthokeratology lenses, they can they can flex like other gas perms too. So running your topographer over top of the lens is a nice little trick. Um, the lenses, they they kind of warp over time. So, you know, you'll hear people talk about, you know, orthokeratology and, and replacing them every year. Well, this is a lot of why it's kind of important. The lenses do just kind of change with time. So if you're not totally sure if you believe that, well, take one of your orthokeratology patients that have been in the lenses for maybe a little bit too long and then run your topography over top of it and see if that base curve really is uh, what you uh, what you have recorded for them in the past. And this is the same the same patient, the same pair of eyes that are just imaged on you know several different um, corneal imaging devices. This is basically just showing what you know orthokeratology is going to look like on a you know a shine fluke device on a uh, profilometer, on a uh, placido disc topographer. So in many ways, you know, they're going to kind of look the same as far as, you know, cooler colors and warmer colors in the same areas. But, you know, there's some subtle little differences. You'll just want to get kind of used to uh, working with your particular device. Okay, dry eye. I think that, you know, it's another thing that a lot of us are, are very familiar with. A lot of these corneal topography units are becoming kind of uh, multifunctional, right? So if it's projecting this ring, this series of rings onto the cornea, which is essentially projecting onto your tear film and you have a bad quality tear film, well, you know, of course, for the longest time, it's like, we're just not going to get a good topography map. But there's there's diagnostics in that in and of itself. If the Myers are kind of breaking apart or becoming distorted, which we call ring jam, well, that in and of itself is indicative of a dry issue or at least uh, a not smooth tear film in that location. So essentially, you know, what these companies just started doing is just um, video recording the topography, okay? Which I think is just called ver video keratography, I believe is the term for that. Which is something, you know, we were always able to do, but but now it's just called non-invasive breakup time. And that's a really important um, thing to do. It's, it's much better than putting fluorescein in your eye, which you're kind of disturbing the eye with, you know, maybe possible reflex tearing or adding some moisture. Um, this is going to be a lot more accurate way of doing it. You can also um, measure the tear meniscus height. These devices will have um, kind of rulers or calipers to essentially do that. Um, you'll even get some metrics, okay? You'll get some um, um, automated kind of tear film uh, surface area kind of metrics. And then infrared. Pretty much every instrument that you have in your whole office has infrared camera in it. It's just that, you know, they're, they may not be using it as a, uh, uh, a functionality um, for measurement and, and uh, capture uh, of the images. But uh, this is, you know, common and affordable technology to put into an instrument. So we use that for my biography and then just regular photos. Some of these devices just take really amazing, amazing photos. 
This is an example of uh, some dry testing. You can see essentially, you know, you got some non-invasive breakup time measurements. You've got your fluorescein images, lysamine green images. Um, you know, you, you know, my, my biography, blepharitis evaluation, and then it, you can get basically, um, kind of more standard reports, or sometimes you can do more custom reports if you want them to look differently. We talked a little bit about some of this as well. I use these devices on all my patients. So basically all ages. Okay. I run, I kind of run everything on everybody. I'm uh, it's kind of my mindset. So, you know, we use infrared imaging. It's a nice way of looking to see, um, you know, obviously infrared is, if you didn't know, it's an invisible light. So they don't sense that any light is shining at them. So it's a really excellent way to essentially be truly observing for things like ptosis, uh, dermatosclerosis, um, pupil abnormalities or anisocoria. Um, as far as, you know, uh, is there any injection of the conjunctiva, um, lid, uh, erythema, um, you know, lid wiper epithelopathy. There's so much, so much that you can do with all these images. And of course, outside of just, you know, corneal screening, right. And corneal mapping. Other things that are becoming more common are going to be basically, uh, optical biometry measurements, which is basically the axial length of the eye. So that's the length of the eye from front to back. Okay. Um, you know, there are some A scan ultrasonography um, um, units out there, and some people feel strongly about them. And, you know, uh, from a return investment standpoint, I understand all that, but there's been a, there's been a good amount in the literature that basically pretty consistently proves that your optical biometry is going to be better and more accurate. So I, I would just recommend using a device that, that does that for you. Um, it's important to know the length of the eye outside of things like myopia management, right? Which is, you know, what you probably know about and hear about. We want to track the length of their eye and we want to compare it to, um, you know, age and, and gender appropriate um, growth charts. And then we make sure that they're in the right place. But this is totally relevant for all your other patients too, right? Your adult patients, maybe just as much, right? Because if you're outside normal limits, maybe you have an eye that's more prone to, you know, retinal detachment or glaucoma. If you have an eye that's really too small or you, are you more prone to things like, you know, angle closure glaucoma. So it also kind of helps you understand, you know, is this, um, their myopia. These are just a couple examples. You got a pretty moderate, you know, kind of run the mill myopia case. Okay. Well, what does five doctors myopia really mean? If you know that that five doctor myope has normal corneas, well, then they probably have a long eyeball, right? And we know from the literature that 26 and a half, that's your cutoff for degenerative myopia. So you can also remember that for billing uh, coding purposes, 26.5 is your, your uh, metric. And then, okay, same minus five myope, uh, but you know if they have a normal uh, length to their eye, well, then they must have a steep cornea, right? And so if your Ks are 47, again, the literature tells us over 47 doctors in your central K, not your steep K or flat case when you're central K right in the middle, uh, that's going to be probable keratoconus. And they say, uh, over 48 is basically, it is keratoconus by that metric. Um, yeah. And then, or do you have like kind of, kind of more or less normal Ks and slightly longer, uh, eye, then it's not much of an issue. And it's the same for the hyperopes, right? If you got a hyperope, you want to know, are they hyperopic because they just got a really flat eyeball, but a pretty normal sized eye and which, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but it's going to be a hard, hard time fitting them in contact sometimes. Or do they have, you know, a normal cornea, but a really short eye in which maybe they're at greater risk for angle closure. Okay. Again, the research or the uh, literature says less than 23 millimeters. Okay. That's going to be your uh, acute angle uh, closure risk. Moving on, we have corneal wavefront analysis. Okay, so a lot of devices will give you uh, corneal wavefront, um, which is like, I guess it's better than nothing. And if there's some corneal ectasia or keratoconus, then yeah, you know, it, it is going to be reflective of, of that, but it's not really super helpful because it's not really indicative of what the total eye uh, is an optical system is giving you. You really want to try, if you can, uh, using devices that are total, total eye um, aberrometry. So that's going to be a Shaq Hartman device or a ray tracing uh, device. Shaq Hartman being, you know, by far the most common. And then um, uh, essentially that just basically uses little lenslets to uh, um, measure back reflection points off the retina. And then these devices will also give you um, essentially an auto refraction. And they're surprisingly 
like accurate, like shockingly accurate. This is an example of a Shaq Hartman um, aberrometry. So again, in the top left, you're going to basically have your, your uh, refraction data. Um, you're going to basically know what the size of the pupil is. This particular patient's pupil is about 6.4 millimeters. You kind of set your optic zone more or less around that, uh, that range. And then, you know, it'll give you your metrics over here. Um, for your reference, essentially, you know, 0.3 or less is kind of normal. 0.3 to 0.6 is like, you know, kind of medium, maybe annoying or bothersome, not totally disruptive. And then 0.6 is considered to be severe. And some of these patients are way above that, right? This patient clearly has keratoconus and they're over here about two and a half. Um, again, with um, infrared imaging, some of these devices are going to offer um, retro illumination. There's not a lot of these out here, but it's really nice software, okay? So it's a great way of seeing things. Obviously, you know, you have your corneal dystrophies. PSE cataracts, those can, I mean, obviously if you're looking real carefully in the microscope, you know, you, you know, you can pick it up, but sometimes pretty subtle PSEs, they're, they're still pretty difficult to see at the slit lamp. And then of course, if that patient's not dilated, then it's, it's much harder because you shine the light with the slit lamp. That's a bright light. Their pupil is going to clamp down. It's going to be, you know, much harder to see that versus infrared, which is again, invisible light to the patient. Their pupil is nice and wide. Uh, down the bottom, it's also a nice way of seeing uh, gutata. So likewise, can be very difficult to see um, at the microscope, but these devices show that very nicely with these tiny little black dots over here. And then of course, you know, checking your um, uh, posterior chamber implants, you're looking for, you know, PCO, um, you know, these surgeons are so good and these implants are so good. You rarely see one of these out of place, but it is a good way of, of uh, confirming your optics. Densitometry is um, a fairly new and, and not common feature, but it's really, really great for a number of reasons. One, uh, sometimes in mild cases, it can help, help you kind of identify uh, maybe where some vision's being uh, reduced from, but also it's great just for monitoring. So scar tissue changes, right? It fades a little bit over time. It's been well documented in the literature that scleral lenses can basically reduce um, some scar tissue that's at least from an inflammatory um, etiology. And so if you want to kind of track that over time, it's a nice way of doing that. This is just an example. This is a case example of that exact same thing. This is maybe, I don't know, a year apart probably from each other. You can see the one on the left, the the gray where it's the hundred percent. This is just kind of marking your borders of your scar tissue. You can see it's getting smaller about a year later than than it was prior. Um, the one at the top. This is talking about you know how much light is basically getting blocked. So you know if you got like where it's red and saying like seventy percent of light's basically not getting through in that location versus where it's blue is saying like twenty percent of light is is basically getting blocked. So like eighty percent is getting through. So uh, this is really, really um, exciting technology. You could do this kind of long-handed uh, with your OCT. Uh, you can image, OCTs take amazing images of scar tissue or opacities in general or, or dystrophies. But, um, you know, it's just, it's tedious. You're only getting a scan in one very specific meridian. Uh, you'd have to take multiple measurements. It's, it's not really practical versus, you know, something like this shine fluid device that's basically already collecting thousands and thousands of data points for you. Glaucoma risk, touched on this a little bit earlier. We were kind of talking about the, the actual length of the eye, but, you know, again, you're Corneal topography, tomography uh, kind of units, a lot of them are able to incorporate some anterior chamber um, measurements. So again, pachymetry, you're going to use that for any number of things from, you know, your, um, you know, kind of uh, conversions of your, your eye pressure, your kind of corrected IOP, uh, as well as obviously your ectasia risk, um, you know, the anterior chamber depth. Um, it's going to give you an, an average angle. Again, with OCTs, you can do that manually, um, but you're only getting in one spot versus this. This is going to take your anterior chamber angle all the way 360 degrees around and it'll give you essentially an, an average number. You'll see those metrics down at the bottom right. Okay. So for your own reference, anterior chamber depth normal is between three to four millimeters. Okay. So, you know, shire in that a little bit, it's not maybe too big, but about two and a half or less is, is, is really very narrow. And then your angle, average average angle should be between 30 to 45. Okay, so this patient's obviously, you know, quite narrow. So let's kind of uh, dive in to, I think we got 
think about another 10, 15 minutes here. So we're going to dive into basically some interpretation of the map. So you're, you know, most people probably have uh, corneal topography or, or at least have seen some of these maps if they don't. And the one that you're going to see the most is going to be your axial maps. It's just, it's, I don't totally know why, but that's the one that everybody kind of shows probably because it's the easiest to kind of get a just a really quick uh, picture interpretation of the eye. If you're looking at astigmatism, if you just kind of see if it if it looks kind of normal or not normal, if it's you know kind of vertical or horizontal, you know if it looks like a lot or a little. So the axial it, it blends colors in a way that makes it really easy to interpret. But ultimately, um, axial and your device it may call it sag sagittal. It's the same thing. Um, it is basically taking um, those calculations. Uh, relative to your visual axis, hence the name. Okay, so think of it if there was a line, a uh, line of sight going directly at the eye, and then all the curvature data around it was just essentially uh, relevant to that one axis. So it's not going to be very accurate as far as looking at the shape of the eye. Okay, it's going to really kind of blend things, smooth them out too much. Your tangential or instantaneous map. It's kind of the opposite. So think of it instead of like one particular axis coming in at the eye, instead you got like hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them. And they're all like these little tangential kind of, you know, kind of lines, you know, basically uh, around the cornea. And that's kind of the, the principle of how it's getting that data. So therefore, you're going to get a totally different, you know, curvature kind of appearance here. This is a lot better for evaluating things like, you know, shape. OK, so is it a normal shape, whether it's ectasia or maybe you're looking at your, uh, you know, corneal reshaping from orthokeratology. OK, and then you have your refractive map, which is kind of like your axial map. It's going to be relative just to that that central axis, but it's going to be only really about the power of the eye from a from a, a, a performance or visual standpoint. So it's going to blend it. If the axial map blends it, refractive map is basically going to blend it even more. OK, all these maps, basically, you know, your, your steeper uh, kind of meridians are going to be uh, warmer colors and your, your flatter meridians are going to be cooler colors. OK, your difference map, I didn't show that because, you know, I think there's other examples that we've we've shown and maybe we'll show uh, with that. But essentially, it's just it's literally just subtracting data points from two different maps and then presenting it as to how much change there was, um, you know, at, at each particular data point. Elevation maps, this is really important for a lot of reasons. One, because everything reverses, everything flip-flops. So basically before your flatter, you know, meridians were cooler in color. Well, now it's the opposite. Now your flatter meridians, which a flatter meridian would actually be higher uh, from an elevation standpoint, that's actually going to be warmer. Okay. And if before in your curvature maps, then your steeper meridians were, were warmer. Now it's the opposite. If your steeper meridian would actually be further away from you, so it'd be kind of lower in elevation, well, those are now going to be cooler. So that's an important distinction there. Your elevation maps are going to basically be probably the most sensitive as far as um, ectasia, keratoconus. And then, you know, particularly if you have a posterior elevation map, that's, that's really ideal. Uh, but even from a, a front of elevation, if you got your regular front elevation, you know, you really need to kind of have your ears perked up there. Um, pachymetry thickness maps is basically just taking your anterior elevation maps and your posterior elevation maps and then just sub subtracting the difference and it builds you this, this corneal thickness map. This one, you know, again, the thinner it is, the warmer the colors, the thicker it is, the cooler the colors, and that's uh, universal. All right, so um, we're not going to go through all this. A lot of this, you know, if you have any of these devices, but you can kind of see, you know, reference on the left and, and on the right. Your Ks are essentially just like, you know, your, your main curvature points on the I. Average K, difference K. I think we can skip this. Most of it, you know, asphericity, that's really pretty important. So, you know, uh, understanding that, you know, probably don't have time for that now. But essentially, it's the rate in which the cornea flattens as it goes further and further out. So uh, that will really tell you a lot about not only the shape of the eye, but when you're fitting um, contact lenses to the eye, really important. Um, pupil size, these devices will typically automatically do things like pupil size and and maybe not always automatically, but you can do a, um, you know, corneal diameter. Okay. Um, I think I referenced already about the uh, the metrics over here. Um, as far as the uh, the wavefront analysis and and kind of what is normal and what's abnormal. All right, so I'm not going to go through all these. Okay, it's too much, and I'm telling you, like there are literally dozens of uh, symmetry uh, analytics. Okay, across 
a number of devices and in the literature, and it's, it's so much. So we're not going to go through this, but what I do want you to do is look to see if any of these look familiar to your device, because some of these are going to be a little more common than others. Probably one of the most common ones I kind of listed up towards the top, that's going to be basically your keratoconus prediction index. It's essentially a, a calculation from a, a few different metrics. It tells you basically, you know, what the chance of your keratoconus. IS, that's also pretty standard. Most, most devices are going to have IS index, and essentially it's just, um, you know, top and bottom. So, um, you, you know, essentially, I think of that almost like a visual fields test, like a glaucoma hemifield test, where it's like, you know, comparing, you know, uh, the superior meridian to to its equal, kind of equal opposite kind of inferior meridian. Um, keratoconus, uh, basically 1.4 to 1.8 is, is pretty suspicious and over 1.8, you know, that's, that's, uh, you can call that keratoconus, um, surface asymmetry, surface regularity, uh, we won't go through this, but it's kind of more of the same. It's kind of basically measuring, um, symmetry either across a 180 meridian, um, all during that kind of like mid peripheral kind of cornea CIM is another common one. Okay. So again, maybe take a screenshot, take a picture with your phone, and then you can kind of reference this on your own devices. This is another one. Uh, again, um, the ones on the top, I'd say the top maybe, I don't know, handful, you'll see on uh, uh, Placido disc devices as well. But the bottom half or so, you're really going to kind of just see this more on um, kind of swept source OCT or shine flug tomography type devices because you're really getting more uh, entire cornea and, and posterior elevation type data involved in this. Your Bell and Ambrosio display in the middle, that's one you're going to see referenced all the time. So that's a really important one to, to kind of be, I guess, somewhat familiar with. Um, and then uh, same thing, you're basically just looking at um, elevation changes. Okay, we're going to move on. All right, so in the last kind of little bit, I just want to kind of talk about my top 10 tips um, for, I guess, successful uh, topography practice. Number one is going to be basically, you know, you're going to want to take multiple maps. Most of these devices, it's really relatively quick to take a picture, save it, take another one, take, you know, three, four, five, six, seven back to back. Um, especially if you're going to be using this to design contact lenses off of, you really want to make sure you're, you're getting really great quality maps. So feel free, take Take lots of pictures. You can always delete them later, but you don't you don't want to take one and then it not be good and then uh, and wish you had taken more. Don't be shy to put in eye drops. Okay, put in you know lubricant drops. Um, and take more images, or if you really have to, you might just have to have them you know kind of treat the dry eye a little bit and have them come back. That's that's not uncommon. Tip number two: If you see ectasia at the surface of the cornea, then you can be pretty sure that you're going to be seeing it on the back of the cornea, okay? So by the time, and, and we know this from all of our keratoconus um, education, the keratoconus starts on the back of the cornea, okay? So if it starts on the back of the cornea and kind of protrudes forward, pushes forward, by the time you see something in the front of the cornea, you, that's, not, that's not really the time to be just totally like, I'll just watch that. I'm not so sure. By the time you see it in the front of the cornea, and particularly if you've taken multiple maps to confirm it, you've got good quality maps that, and, and you're getting that, that's one to I probably either refer out for tomography for um, um, confirmation or or maybe even a cross linking consult. But by the time you see on the front of the eye, be sure that that um, you're very likely going to get already have it on the back of the eye or back of the cornea. All right, tip number three. Okay, pollution marginal degeneration. Okay, the uh, the kind of iconic you know kissing birds. Okay, well this comes up I feel like pretty commonly. You know. Um, if you are seeing pollution marginal degeneration, I'll be honest, you probably not. <laughs> you probably not. I, it's super rare. Okay. Now with placido disc devices, it's going to look more common. So if you look at some of the images up at the, up at the top, you see that very typical kind of, you know, kissing birds type of thing, mustache, whatever different terms that people use. But a couple of things can kind of cue you in. This is probably not, you know, pellucid. One, if you kind of look at your elevation map, Typically, where the highest point in elevation curvature, it's going to be very close to where that the thinnest point of, of the cornea is. Okay, really within a millimeter or two, it's very common. So, in each of these squares, okay, all your devices you can put on or take off these these grids. Each of these squares is one millimeter. So, if you count the millimeters one, two, that means that the elevation peak is at two millimeters south of center. Uh, that's not very far away. If this is a thirteen, according to these metrics, a thirteen millimeter cornea. 
you know, that's not what pollution marginal degeneration stands for. Okay. Um, now on the bottom, or I guess I should say the, the middle row, this is the same eye just with, you know, tomography. And you'll still see a little bit of that kind of kissing birds type of thing on both eyes, right? But, you know, now that you can get your pachymetric um, corneal thickness measurements, you see, yeah, it's really nowhere near the margin. And then your your uh, OCT images, your Scheinflug uh, images kind of confirm that, right? So for it to really be PMD, it's got to be way off to the side. So here's here's an example of PMD, right? So you will still see that kind of kissing birds type of um, appearance. But then when you look over here at the corneal thickness, red is going to be the thinnest point. Remember in pachymetric maps, the warmer colors are always the thinnest. So where you see that really bright red, that is like roughly 300 microns or so on, on both eyes over here. So that's way down towards the margin of the cornea, hence the you know peripheral marginal degeneration. And then when you look at the OCT scan, you see how thin it is way, way, way out there towards towards the, uh, the limbus, okay? So that it's very rare. You're not likely seeing it. So, okay, uh, number four, if you're designing lenses off corneal topography, I really highly recommend that you do it off of a single capture map. It is sometimes nice. Some of these devices will allow you to stitch and composite images together. That can be helpful if you're just trying to get an overall lay of the land and see kind of what the, the quality of the, the, the shape of the eye looks like. That certainly has its advantages. You can see on the, on the bottom right, you know, you get some kind of lid and lash interference, um, some, um, um, I forget the term, you know, escaping me at the moment. Um, but yeah, I and mean, you basically get some like bottom eyelid or tear meniscus interference. But and so you can composite it and get a really beautiful picture. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily trust the the individual metrics there. It's going to be much more liable to just get one really solid, great single capture scan uh, to actually design uh, your images off of. Ultimately, when you do composite and stitching, you're you're telling the software to either average two data points that are not the same, which is basically making both of them lie, or you're telling it to, you know, preference one data point and then not the other. And therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. Adjust your scales. Okay. This is like, I, you know, I hate to say pet peeve, but it kind of, it just, it is what it is. You know, you have to know kind of how, what you're looking at over here. So if you're doing like, you know, your metrics or even just look in the eye, you basically want to see the highest points of the cornea and the lowest points in the cornea, um, but seeing way beyond the highest point, way below the lowest point and just maxing out your scales, it doesn't give you any information. It's not, it's not clinically relevant. It's, it's not, it's not useful. Um, so anyways, this is kind of a corneal topography. You really have no idea how flat the middle of the, the cornea is because, you know, it's deeper and darker than the deepest, darkest blue. All right. And then your reshaping is deeper and darker than the, the, the deepest, darkest red. So you have no idea where you're at. So instead, you want to adjust your scales. Okay. There's a lot of ways you can do that. And we can, you know, have talked about it another, another time. But ultimately, you want to be able to see the limits. Okay. Particularly with corneal orthokeratology, you want to adjust your scales so you can see exactly where you're at the bottom, checking your shape, checking your power change. Same thing. Okay. You want to be able to see both with, with power, with axial maps, or refractive maps. You'll be able to know how much prescription you're, you're actually changing. So it's really great to, to really learn uh, your device in that way. Okay, corneal uh, alignment or capture alignment. This is also important because this goes back to angle kappa, right? So when they're looking straight ahead at whatever the target is in the instrument, which is typically maybe a fixation, you know, light, um, they're their cornea is not facing exactly the same direction that their visual axis is, right? So their fovea is kind of facing that, that fixation target within your device, but the cornea would then actually be facing outwards. So then when you go to take your maps, they're not, they're not really mapping the cornea as precisely, at least with these kind of uh, placido disc devices. So you can see at the top, this is when the patient's looking straight ahead into the device. But if you have them look just slightly nasally, now their corneas have rotated into a position that your, your rings, your mires are now going to appropriately map out the, the surface of the cornea. You're going to get a much better, um, I guess, information as far as um, the, the true shape of that cornea. Also, you know, it's better information to fit the lens or uh, uh, assess um, uh, your reshaping patterns later. 
Another thing that's really nice um, is the ability, if possible, to delete erroneous data points, right? So sometimes you just can't totally get rid of the eyelashes or some anatomical structure or, you know, the dryness. It's, it's really not a terrible problem, but just there's one little spot that you don't like. Um, again, the software will basically blend some of that data points. Okay, it's called interpolation. But there's also devices out there that will let you delete them. So if you can delete them, that certainly helps. So you can see over here what that looks like to basically get rid of these little white dots. Okay, at the top, that'd be like the original scan. You get some interference maybe from uh, from the limbus or maybe some, it could be anything. It could be some nodules or something out there. And then if you delete them, now you can get rid of some of the, the quote unquote, the noise. Um, the actual alignment, geometric alignment, I, I do think that this slide just out of order, so my apologies. This goes back one, but ultimately it will matter. Going if you look at an actual alignment versus the geometric alignment at the bottom, you, you know it's not the same eye, right? You look at the elevation maps. Okay, when when they're looking straight at the instrument, it's going to fool you into you know a certain shape that's not even real. And then when they basically you know you get back into that geometric alignment, which is your your true. Uh, position you want to be making these maps in, at least from a shape uh, analysis uh, standpoint, you can see it's it's really a very different shape altogether. Okay, number eight, label your maps. You'll be glad you did later. Okay, this is basically- I hate to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to maybe uh, go to the last one? And yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to just leave this one slide. This is the last slide here, just because it does include just um, just CPT codes um, in case you want to take a screenshot of that or anything. Uh, these are common CPT codes that can be built with, with these devices.